Hey everyone, welcome back to I Married a Film Snob, where we review films of today and yesteryear. Today, we're going to review the A24 film Men, directed by Alex Garland. First, let me just say that in a world of sequels, prequels, remakes, reboots, and never-ending superhero movies, it is absolutely refreshing to have filmmakers like Alex Garland and studios like A24 backing them in their projects. Yeah, it's probably Alex Garland's best film yet. There are so many layers to uncover the depth of this film. Men is a truly original nightmare, of the best kind, that will linger with you long after you finish watching the movie. The film stars the phenomenal Jesse Buckley as Harper, a woman looking to get away at a countryside retreat after experiencing a very traumatic event in her life. She's renting a country home as a means to try and put her past behind her and heal some of her emotional wounds. Simple premise, but... What transpires in the chain of events that follow are just cinematic surreal fever dream layered with metaphor and symbology, some more obvious than others. Let me follow it up by saying the cinematography is stellar and the compositions are clean and precise without calling too much attention to themselves, a true mark of a great filmmaker. There are moments of visual flourishes that really excel in their beauty and surreal depictions. The pacing for a modern film is measured yet effective. And there are scenes which take their time and allow us to really soak in the environment and the landscapes while still progressing the dread that is slowly building up throughout the movie. Yeah, the cinematography was phenomenal. The recurring juxtaposition of red and green really added a dramatic effect to each scene and frame. Green and red are opposing primary colors which makes them so striking. Red heightens the feelings of passion, love, anger, and violence, while green conveys cleanse, rebirth, clarity, and serenity. Alert. The intentional red glow in the confrontational scene between James and Harper in their apartment amplifies the intensity of the conversation as well as their emotions. The interior of the house is also red and dramatizes the scenes with the male invaders. Even at the end of the film, we see the red motif return with the red of the brake lights intensifying Joffrey's turn from country gentleman to raging maniac when he pulls Harper out of the car. On the other end of the spectrum, we witness lush green scenery when Harper decides to go for a walk in the fields nearby. In that scene, it is one of the few instances of the movie we see Harper totally serene and at peace with herself. The lushness and maternal spirit of nature are present and seem to momentarily, at least, dull any pain she's experiencing. This is visually amplified by the waves of green flora that surround her. And for some reason, these scenes brought back memories of Tarkovsky's Stalker, when the characters are walking through the zone, traversing utterly green, lush, and overgrown landscapes. Yeah, one of the obvious themes is toxic masculinity. Now, we know that trauma heavily influences our perception of the world and people, and having each male role played by the same actor, Rory Kinnear, conveys that Harper feels all men are the same after what she's experienced. Harper also finds herself with lack of control in almost every situation. Harper lets Jeffrey carry in her bags, lies about not playing the piano in order to end the conversation sooner, and about not getting around to changing her name, implying that she's divorced to avoid further explanation. She further lets Jeffrey pay at the bar, and we see the vicar blame his sexual urges on Harper which fits the stereotype that all women are temptresses. In an earlier scene with the vicar, his repressed sexual tension is evident when he places his hand on her knee for a significantly long time. The priest also undermines James physically hitting Harper by stating that it isn't a capital offense. He then blames Harper for James's actions and holds her accountable for his death, further displaying his insensitivity and perpetual defense of men over women. Later on in the film, after Harper leaves the bar, she hears the same scream from the tunnel. She stops and considers going back to the pub for safety, but then doesn't give in to the damsel in distress reflex and continues back to the cottage. There are clear archetypes and stereotypes of men in the film. We have Jeffrey, the persistent gentleman, the indifferent and dismissive cop, the selfish and vulgar kid, the sexually repressed vicar, and the classic vapid and aggressive male bar hopper. Upon Harper's arrival, she gets a lay of the country home. It's ironic that as Jeffrey's showing her around, he says, don't need to lock the doors around here. We soon realize that Harper spends the entire film trying to keep invaders out. Soon, she decides to go for a walk nearby. And in the serene walk, Harper finds a tunnel, a visual representation of a halfway channel between two worlds of interior and exterior. And inside, she decides to play with the echo and harmonize her voice. In doing so, her transformed voice becomes like a chant, almost like a Gregorian chant that seems to awaken a spirit, a deity. We don't know just yet, but her song has been noticed and something latches onto her. And in that, a repeating theme of duality and rebirth emerges. In some cultures and beliefs, going out into nature and encountering a wilderness spirit or deity is meant to signal 
a rebirth, or an emotional maturing, a rite of passage, if you will, that allows a person to leave their past behind them and start anew. It is worth noting that she later encounters a similar tunnel, but this time the entrance has been bricked up and locked. Her chant eventually transforms into the score of the film, which was so unique and the soundtrack perfectly sets the tone for each and every scene. And this ties into the more layered symbolism and metaphors of the film, especially relating to the naked green man, a pagan deity of nature who in different versions throughout history is let loose or is sometimes always present but hiding, out of sight, who loves to cause mischief and unbox repressed emotions. This spirit creature is intricately tied to how Harper will have to face all her past demons and how their physical embodiment will have to be confronted for her to overcome any mental trauma. To me, this green man is not really malevolent in a deeper sense. Even though he is emotionally torturous to Harper, he's more of a trickster, the classic trickster figure throughout different religions and beliefs. He's a catalyst, a spark from nature, just hoping to awaken what's inside Harper that needs to be confronted and she seems to be bottling away. The green man in some scenes is even shown as just an observer, just looking, almost with a childlike sense of curiosity. And with this curiosity, the naked man inspects the tree as if realizing Harper has taken the forbidden fruit, almost like nature is questioning her decisions or realizing that her transformation has already begun. Later on, we see all of the apples falling from the tree. Could this mean the loss of all innocence? or furthering of Harper's transformation. Rory Kinnear magically transforms with each version he is tasked to play, from an innkeeper, to a policeman, to a vicar, to a small boy, to a couple of hooligan barflies. Kinnear is excellent, and with the little screen time he's given to each character, is expertly capable to encapsulate the essence of each man, even in the briefest of scenes. In a pivotal scene of the movie, the green man blows a breath of life infused with some sort of dandelion flora that will allow Harper to enter a deeper sense of reality and enhance her emotions. Again, in many cultures, traditional cultures, blowing breath or smoke is meant to signify a spiritual cleanse to follow. The green man is helping Harper confront her demons, but in a horrifying way. Harper ingests a piece of this flora infused breath, and in that moment, it's almost as if she's experiencing the beginning of a hallucinatory ritual or rite, in which she will have to face challenges and tests and overcome them before she can be reborn and spiritually cleansed. Now, again, what does the dandelion represent? Hallucination has begun, nature influencing Harper's grieving process. At one point, we see the same dandelion go into the eye of a deer carcass. Then both pagan deities are shown. The camera then pans out of the deer's eye and we discover that carcass is further decomposed. Towards the end of the film, Harper ingests the dandelion as if finally accepting the green man's influence. Hallucinations are then shown with the altar now appearing in the apartment and the bedroom of the cottage rental. The altar in the church is very important and we see it repeatedly because it symbolizes the duality of the pagan spirit going after Harper. On one side of the stone centerpiece is the face of the green man and on the other side is a birthing woman and this is exactly what the spirit deity chasing Harper is. Two different sides of the same coin. It is both male and female, fertility and rebirth in one. This Janus duality actually ties into how pagan folklore sometimes opposes Christian beliefs, yet are sometimes present and revered in one church, the old world with the new world. The movie does feature pagan iconography, yet also simultaneously depicts images associated with Christian connotations. From the forbidden fruit in the tree, to a stigmata puncturing through the palm of the hand of James. A resurrection of sorts through rebirth. So it's about the two forces that oppose each other, but also work together as one. Exactly. And in the scene where the vicar attempts to console Harper, a fallen cross is skillfully framed in the composition. It is carefully positioned next to the vicar to imply that he is not a true man of God and has fallen from faith. When Harper arrives to the cottage rental, she picks and bites into an apple when Jeffrey soon thereafter jokes and says she mustn't eat the forbidden fruit. Eating the forbidden fruit implies the loss of innocence, and in Harper's case, the beginning of her transformation. It is revealed in the final scene that the green man represents both deities, as you mentioned, through his ability to birth the different male archetypes. And this leads us to the shocking ending, the rebirthing scene. <laughs> Whoa! Let me stop right here and say that Garland had to know exactly how divisive this ending would be. And he would leave many audiences in the dark and confused and others enthralled. But I applaud him for having the balls to take such a cinematic risk. When we first saw this movie in theaters, we rewatched it recently in Blu-ray, but when we first saw this in theaters, during this scene, I briefly looked around to try to surmise how everyone else in the theater was digesting this shocking scene. And I was amazed 
at how surreal and brave a quote-unquote mainstream film showing up my local AMC, not some midnight cold screening with Jorodowski or Lynch devotees, was willing to test their audience. In this scene, the deity, a man, starts to literally give birth to different versions of men that have confronted Harper up until that point. And we're shown this in graphic detail. Yeah, I mean, I gotta say, these special effects on that ending scene are just <laughs> insane. absolutely insane, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but stunning Yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And it made it so believable, too. Yeah, you, you know, it, what's crazy, and that's the skill of, of a filmmaker like Garland, is a scene like that could immediately pull you away and say, but you believe it. For a second, you say, okay, it's, it's done so well that you don't ever doubt it for a sec. Yeah. And, and each, with each birth, it is entirely intentional. I remember some reviewers had said, oh, you know, once would have been enough, but it, it, no. you, it's required to show the process of each archetype, right? So we see first the kid, then we see the vicar, then we see Jeffrey, and then and finally then James. James. So, so it was entirely necessary. Yeah, to, to go through each iteration yes. of this masculinity that is reverting back to, to James. Yeah. And that, you know, in that, all these versions have the same scars and the same injuries that James had when he fell from the apartment. The slit wrists all the way from the fence, mm -hmm. the snapped ankle, the head wounds, these wounds are duplicated in each version. It's like those injuries are coming back to haunt her in different men, but they're still there. Now in this scene, what's very important to note is that Harper is not horrified or even tries to run away. She has a time. In fact, she's almost calm, as if she knows what the final version of To Be Rebirth will be, which of course turns out to be her husband, James. She knows he's coming one last time to test her. She needs to confront him one more time. From her smile in the final image of the film, we can surmise that she was able to overcome and defeat any demons she had attached to that emotional trauma. Harper's accepting of her fate. She's not running anymore. So she walks into the house, calmly sits, and waits. We then see James, of course, and he is the physical manifestation of her guilt. Yeah, the final culmination of all these men that have been one begot the other and begot the other. She needs to go back to the first one. And then, at the very end of the couch conversation, she checks the sharpness of the axe, implying that she literally kills guilt and has reached the final stage of the grieving process, acceptance. Last point worth discussing is that especially during the climax and ending, you're, you're constantly wondering, what's reality, what's hallucination, what's her grief personified? Is she a reliable narrator or protagonist? Has her grief tainted her sense of reality? But in the final scene, when Harper's friend shows up, it is evident something has happened. It's not just some fever dream. There is a trail of blood into the house and her car is smashed up. And of course, then there's a little nod that her friend is actually pregnant herself. Again, a visual metaphor of some of the things we've been discussing. Through all of this, we wanted to analyze, is Harper a reliable narrator? And... You say no. Yeah, absolutely not. So in the opening scene, we see Harper standing still and then jumps as if startled or snapping out of being spaced out. She then closes the balcony door and then witnesses James falling from above. Was Harper startled because she heard James break into the upstairs apartment? Or did she simply just snap out of being in shock from actually witnessing James fall out from their apartment? Another example of why I think she's unreliable is when Harper goes out for the walk and she passes the abandoned house. We don't see anything strange about the house, right? And then when Harper turns around to take a picture on her phone, we then see the naked man in the distance. So it makes you wonder, was he always there? And when Harper first approaches the block tunnel... After she's running, you mean? After she's running away, when she first sees right. a man chasing her out of the tunnel. Right. Then she goes and encounters a whole other tunnel. Right. That's entirely blocked off with the bricks and the locks. So she nervously walks up the hill and takes the detour to the trail. But so then later on in a flashback, um, she's shown frantically banging on the door. So we're not sure what actually happened. Let me just say that great movies don't give up their answers easily. Some audiences want everything easily spoon fed to them or gift wrapped with a nice bow. So it's easy to digest and understand. This film is not for them. The layers and symbology are sometimes hard to decipher and sometimes blatant with some critics tuning out 
and others just saying the movie's message is too obvious and the movie just mashes you over the head with it over and over. But even if this were true, does it make the experience and the layers that got you there any less potent? I don't think so. This is an expertly crafted film, brave enough to challenge us in visual and metaphoric ways, and it is backed by a truly wonderful and masterful performance by Jesse Buckley and Kinnear. The score is haunting, and we get to see both an intimate portrayal by actors into what almost amounts to be a two-person stage show with a few locations, while simultaneously showering us with amazing visuals and visual effects that can craft to reality the wildest of conceptions of a filmmaker not afraid to go against the grain. Overall, if I had to rate this film, I would give it a 9 or 9.5 out of 10, which is pretty high. Oh yeah, that's pretty high, especially for you. Yeah, Woo! that's... <laughs> I really liked it. Yeah, it's probably one of the best films of 2022. So, so far, far. How about you? What's your rating? My rating? Um, it was pretty up there. Maybe a solid nine. I okay. Think. So yeah. nine or 9.5 and nine. That's still pretty good. Go watch it. Yes. If you haven't already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're done. I think we're done. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss more Film Snob reviews. Mm -hmm.